Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Expat Chats Series 67. Today we'll be featuring Sean, who will be sharing stories and tips about how to run a nonprofit as a digital nomad. So for anyone who is new to Expat Chats, this is a live series that we started to share the inspiring stories of Black expats and nomads living abroad. Requests. Oh, great. There we go. All right, perfect. Hello. hello. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing okay. Thank you for inviting me. No, such a pleasure to have you on. Um, I know me and you had a chance to meet in person because you're here in Portugal right now. So that was really nice. Um, and the more <laughs> I learned about what you were doing, I was like really excited to get you on um, as well. Mm -hmm. So I've done a brief intro um, as the host, but I would like for you to introduce yourself and kind of just jump right in into how you got started, um, you know, not just working abroad, but also a nonprofit, running a nonprofit as well. Yeah, I always get anxious about that question. Introduce yourself because my yeah. story is long. Yeah, <laughs> listen, we have time. We have time. Go ahead. <laughs> um, how? Where do I begin? I mean, so because I, as I tell my story, I also rediscover who I am as well. So yes. uh, that's why I, uh, I also enjoy it a lot. So I mean, I am the grandchild of a diplomat. Uh, my grandfather was. Um, head of external affairs for the Nigerian government for over, what is it, like 25 years? Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> um, like, I grew up knowing that my grandfather was living abroad in yes. Egypt while I was, you know, being born, when I was born and raised in New York City. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess, like, this expat kind of life or just living abroad was in my genes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before, even started, before you even thought of, it was already out there. Yeah, the yeah, genes. yeah. But um, yeah, but then like just on a personal level, I've always felt like my life was always outside of the U.S. So like that's always been a personal goal of mine. Um, so I've always been working since like the age of like 11, literally. <laughs> to I get it. Pursue that, to be abroad. Mm -hmm. I studied French when I was in middle school, like preparing myself. And then um, I, you know, first I went to undergrad for communication. So I have a, a degree in English and communications, work, was working, started working in media, and then eventually went abroad to grad school um, to the University of London. So that was my wow. first foray into living abroad. And I studied international management. So it's like this <laughs> <Makes sense. laughs> of being out there. Mm -hmm. But then long story short, um, I fast forward, I don't know, like a decade later, mm -hmm. um, I run my own hybrid organization. It's both an LLC mm -hmm. and also has a not-for-profit component to it. It's called Carfi. Carfi okay. is the LLC. Okay. And then the Carfi Foundation is the nonprofit entity and it has a mission to obtain and sustain resources for aspiring African leaders. Okay. I always qualify that when I say African, don't mean that you'd have to have like direct or you don't have the your immediate family saying oh we're from this country in mm -hmm. africa right mm -hmm. i mean everyone in the african diaspora um, yes but i just say african because i think we need to just own that identity yes right? yes, <laughs> yes yes and i know it's hard for a lot of people to identify because they don't know specifically where they're from but I get it because the term black is really an American term, right? Um, I use that for the app, but it's an American term. Like right? you meet people from other places, that's not really part of the concept of how they identify, even if they are what we call black. <laughs> so yeah, it's important yeah. for us to start owning where we're actually from, even if we don't know the specific place, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And one of the things um, that I wanted to touch on and kind of get some insight into because you could have very easily, you know, just ran the for-profit part of your business and, you know, not have, because running a nonprofit is difficult. Um, what made you really kind of make it hybrid and step into the nonprofit space? That's a great question, because um, I did a lot of self-reflecting. I tell myself a lot, like, I could be a millionaire if I didn't care so much. Yes, no, I <laughs> About the world. <laughs> we can have a whole conversation about that. Because I have a big <laughs> complex where you just are trying to always like, you know, help underserved and all this stuff. And it, it's frustrating sometimes because that's not always profitable. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, it's funny that you bring up the Robin Hood complex because I, I talk about that. So I had a TED talk um, okay. in 2020 and I purposely titled it How to Save the World on Less Than a Dollar a Day mm -hmm. because I was and in the speech, I'm doing it like out loud. I was like, 
reflecting on my like inability to feel comfortable and want to just pursue my own like interest yes without making sure that my own people are okay too yeah so that, that that basically is the answer to your question of why I decided to make it hybrid so I started car free like just by accident like mm -hmm. I was like entertaining after being in um grant writing for a, a while like mm -hmm. working full-time for another company um, going into again working in African um, issues yeah. and I started attending a lot of conferences at universities so Harvard University runs this major African business conference every okay. year um, and that was one of the first ones that I attended uh -huh. and I was just hearing all of these amazing things it was when I was first introduced to the concept of startup mm -hmm. and venture capitalism and I was hearing how people are using their businesses that they're creating to provide solutions, sustainable solutions to issues that they're seeing on the continent. Okay. So whether it's like creating like a healthcare startup, creating yeah. obviously tech startups mm -hmm. that like revolve around infrastructure building. Um, and so I was fascinated by that. And, you know, I was asking a lot of questions, um, networking, bump, rubbing shoulders with people <laughs> who I didn't realize who were gonna eventually be my clients. Oh, like okay. they told me, hey, we need you. Yes, <laughs> you yes. need to, like we need to hire you to help us like with this fundraising thing. Okay. And so by force, I was like, okay, I guess I'm starting a business. <laughs> yes, no, listen, that's a great way to start organically. And what was yeah. the name of, is that conference something that anyone can attend or is it if you like only go to mm -hmm. Harvard? No, no, anybody can attend it. So it's called okay. the African, it's literally called the African Business Conference, ABC. Okay, you all heard it <laughs> here. This, I like to, I like to drop, drop practical tips for people so they can, you know, they're interested, they can follow up. Okay. And so mm -hmm. the concept of what you're trying to do or what you are doing is really to support and connect entrepreneurs in Africa to a certain networks, right? So that they can get the work done pretty much. <laughs> yes, Absolutely. yes, yes. Because there's something to say, um, to be said about the power of networks. Um, and I think, you know, we're even, we're realizing it here um, in Lisbon, how powerful it is for us to have access to each other and be connected. Um, it really just mm -hmm. changed the experience. But likewise in business, it's not always about merit or, you know, the hard work you're doing. Sometimes it's like, do you know the right person? Like, seriously, do you know mm -hmm. the right person? And that opens more doors than any amount of hard work could ever open. So um, the reason why I think what you're doing is so significant is because there are certain things that, like, we, you don't know you don't know because you're not in these rooms. You're not a part of these discussions. You're not at that table. And because of that, you just kind of reach, like, what do you call it when someone is um, – it's like you're capped, kind of. You know, you can't even get into certain spaces. And so <laughs> when you started, how did you eventually um, start in the nonprofit aspect of this? Because, um, you know, so the business part happened pretty organically as a result of this conference yeah. and networking. At what point did you really realize, like, I should add a nonprofit arm to this? Right. Yeah. Um, so going back to what I was saying about, like, you know, the, the TED Talk or what, I, I appreciated the fact that people were taking a chance on me and saying okay. that we see something in you and you should really start this business so that we can hire you to do the work. Um, but then like two years into having the LLC, mm -hmm. I noticed a pattern because um, I'm just like that, like intuitive, or I just like think a lot about these things that mm -hmm. the people who are constantly coming to me with these ideas and concepts about saving or, you know, creating solutions to challenges in Africa came from the U.S. Like they were... Mm -hmm. U.S. educated. Mm -hmm. Yes, they might have been born. Some of them were born abroad and then their yes. parents brought them over and then they, you know, happened to be able to attend these elite schools like yes. Harvard, Columbia University. And so we're in like a privileged kind of situation too. Like we're mm -hmm. kind of in this, the diaspora is in this weird space where we're now like kind of like the privileged, right? Mm -hmm. Even though we don't feel like it. I know. Um, and then we're going <laughs> back to kind of like the sense of, not all of us, but mm -hmm. either like, you know, not noticing it or maybe like actually like very um, obviously we're coming with this kind of like superior complex yes to yes. africa um mm -hmm. forgetting where we came from whereas there's people on the ground who were not lucky enough to go to harvard or even like you know just go to school period outside of their countries yes. who are figuring out how to get things done before we get there yes yes <laughs> yes figuring out the solutions to these problems and yes. i was like those are the entrepreneurs like those that are the people that we exactly <laughs> Yeah. So um, I wrote up this like articles of, of, of incorporation, like mm -hmm. starting to write out that concept, not knowing if anybody was going to support it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because like, again, like in the space of venture capital and just like entrepreneurship or business in general, it's like 
what what do you bring to the table is always that kind of like mm -hmm. what it has to be like a give and take not just like always taking yeah and a lot of people see these um individuals as like lesser than like what are they bringing to the table like how can mm -hmm. we truly trust them mm -hmm. with our like money or our capital to build something that we believe is going to be a success and so um i was lucky enough to get seed funding like literally within like two months of that's amazing yes. <laughs> yes 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 as a not for profit yeah. And then, um, yeah, I'm happy to talk about like one of the fir first projects that we did to kind of like solidify that concept that was in my head. Yes, yes, yes. I think it's important because one of the things that you pointed out is like the people closest to the problem normally have a better way to solve it. So getting outsiders, you know what I mean? It's not always going to be the best solution. The outsiders may have the resources, but the actual thought process, you know what I mean? And the ability to solve what's going on. You need to engage the people who are part of the problem as well, you know, or the issues or the challenge, whatever it may be. So, no, I understand your approach. So what kind of walk us through that first, you know, big project that you did that kind of solidified, like, yes, this, it kind of validates, right? You know, your idea, like, this is going to work. Mm. It was a push and pull, I'll say. Like, in retrospect, I'm like, it's a lot. <laughs> but it was good to have that immediate stamp of approval when yes. I first started. Um, yes. And I think it's important to tell these like stories of wins and losses when it yes. comes to running a nonprofit. Yeah. Sorry, I'm like doing a lot of preamble, but I just want to like no, let you guys no, no. know. <laughs> let you guys know that, you know, um it's it's not as easy like as it sounds and it really takes a lot of tenacity and saying I'm gonna stick with it. Mm -hmm. Um it's 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 even almost as more complicated it's even more complicated almost than um, just starting a regular business. Yeah. So um, I applied to a grant, like I mentioned, and I got seed funding both from uh, the Pollination Project, which um, is an organization that intentionally gives out seed funding to first time um, not-for-profit starters. Okay. And then I also got seed funding from um, PNC Bank. Okay. Um, just by through relationship building. That okay. can be a whole other story if we yeah. have time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But um, the proposal basically was to go, first it was to go to a refugee camp um, mm -hmm. and, and offer some uh, entrepreneurship workshops there to the um, young people who are, because I was watching, a, I think it was either a documentary on BBC or, you know, one of these um, uh, media channels where they were showing like what they have to do in order to survive within the refugee camps as they're just waiting, mm -hmm. like almost like forever to be placed um, in a place that's going to be their permanent home. Mm -hmm. And the waiting period is never like clear cut. Mm -hmm. It can be like one year, it can be like five years. People like oh literally spend their whole time. Yeah. I'm like, this is not, what solution are, like, what is this solving, right? Yeah. So I was like, maybe we go there, we teach them how to truly build sustainable family businesses okay. that if they're going to be there, that actually doesn't make the refugee camp feel like a, like a prison or just yes. feels like a place that's dilapidated and lack of lack of growth yeah. but actually can produce like you know cities and communities where people are thriving if yeah. they're going to be there yeah. um that fell through for a couple of reasons but i eventually mm -hmm. then ended up doing the project in um kibera okay. so i was living the next place that i lived abroad um was in nairobi kenya and okay. if you don't know yeah kibera is one of the largest urban slums in on the continent oh, wow. and i think it's the second largest in the world after um, the one in Mumbai in India, if okay. I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So just think of that, like the, one of the largest populations of people in this very, very small, like when I did a tour of it, it's big, but it's not like that big. And there's okay. just, it's very densely populated. Okay. No running water, no paved roads. Mm -hmm. um, some NGOs go in there here and there to mm -hmm. you know, provide supplies, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But um, it's very under-resourced. Mm -hmm. And again, you see people selling jewelry that they handcrafted mm -hmm. on their mm -hmm. own. Mm -hmm. you see people learning, how they, people self taught themselves how to repair cars mm -hmm. so that they can provide that as a service yes, yes, like yes. no formal training no trade school mm -hmm. certificate that like they put themselves <laughs> yeah, and i was just watching that and i was like okay this this is this is evidence of what i'm talking about like yes, the yes, entrepreneurial yes. spirit yeah. when you have to save yourself when yes. you can't wait for someone to come in and save you and rescue you so um in partnership with a local ngo that was there um i put together this four-day workshop where there was about 50 participants 
We did a partnership with two other startups that I <laughs> built a relationship with the CEOs there. Mm -hmm. And one of those startups was funded by one of the largest telecom uh, companies in East Africa called Safaricom. Okay. Okay. So Safaricom was able to give uh, these attendees free resources to build like their customer relationship management systems. And these are all terms like, again, like yeah. they will probably like, never be familiarized with or would never yes. be introduced to if we didn't go there and did the, do this workshop. It's something that we as business owners take for granted. Yeah, yeah. If some yeah. of you run businesses and know about like um, oh, online marketing and stuff like that yeah. um, or you know, e-commerce. So we taught them all of those things in four days. And um, the video is actually on my YouTube channel if you guys want to see a recap of it. But it, it just put like a battery in my back and was like, yeah. <laughs> this is what yeah. I'm talking about. This, this is, is exactly this. what you were just talking about. Them the resources. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Connecting the resources to the people. Because again, it's not a lack of talent, a lack of skill. It's a lack of you having access. A lack of resources being available. Yeah, it's totally different. And and so when you think about, because again, I don't think people realize, you know, providing people with the ability to be self-sufficient, right? To take care of themselves and all that thing is so much better than just giving funding, right? It's like, no, this is like, how can you build and be sustained and sustain yourself without outside support? And it's one of those things that I don't think we put enough emphasis on when we think about like what type of NGOs, what type of nonprofits are we going to support, right? Because you can't mm -hmm. put a Band-Aid on these things. You really got to fix the root problem. You know what I mean? So Yeah, I, yeah. I guess that's like a, that's a caution to anyone out there. Um, mm -hmm. And I definitely want to see more of us starting these NGOs, starting mm -hmm. these not-for-profits that do go back there to just really take your time and think about how can you include the local population yeah. in the work that you're trying to do how can you empower them yeah um versus just coming in with what you think is the best solution for sure exactly and even just making sure like to empower instead of exploiting because i think so many people i mean like let's say they were to start supporting but they're like okay you make jewelry um we'll buy the jewelry off of you and then they go sell it for 50 dollars. you know what i mean yeah. stuff like that and so i think that's the other part like how do you protect, um, you know, the, the people who are producing this work, if they are, if they do have a product, from getting exploited from um, pretty much people from the outside coming in and seeing like, ooh, we can make, we can sell that jewelry overseas, you know, <laughs> for 10 times the price. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yep, absolutely. And so it seems like a lot of what you were doing or what helped you when, as you kind of reflect, and even when you think about when you first started, a lot of it is relationship building. So when we think about like the tips for nonprofit people running a nonprofit, regardless of whether you're a digital nomad or not, that relationship building part is so essential. Um, what okay. has helped you even get comfortable with that soft skill of like relationship building? Because for some people, it's not natural for them, right? Um, some people yeah. are, you know, they they're good with the type. What is it? Type A skills, but not, you know, they don't necessarily have like people skills, people person or personal skills. I don't have personal skills either. <laughs> I, I, am, I have been lucky enough to be forced into, and this is what I really loved about um, what the last person, the one, the woman who's from Senegal, oh, um, what she said. Mm -hmm. Like, I forgot how she said it. Like something like God is gonna um, get butter out the duck. I was like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I am the duck. Okay. <laughs> and, I was, and he's like, yo, you're going to produce, right? Yes, yes. So, like, I grew up, like, extremely, extremely timid. Like, okay. the shown today, if the shown in the past was the shown today, she would have been like, wow. Yes. And I don't even think that I'm that far, like, in where I need to be. But I think it's, like, circumstances. So, it's, it's, a, it's a couple of things. I think that, number one, when you're coming, when it comes to, like, relating to people and trying to build authentic relationships as yeah. people, whether it's business or not empathy is really important and we yes. throw that word around a lot and i don't think we actually know what it means mm -hmm. so the best way i can put it is that like when you when you go into those like tough moments like as an entrepreneur or i don't know just like someone in life who's trying to figure things out mm -hmm. and then you're getting ready to go and talk to someone about something that you feel is like really really important to you like whether it's like a business deal that you're negotiating or it's a pitch for whatever reason i found it's been very great it's been very helpful for me to go back to the my like memory rolodex mm -hmm. and like put myself back in those positions where like 
I thought that this was the end <laughs> and, so, and see where I am now and see how I somehow got out of that. Because there's times where I literally we sit, sit there in these moments and like, this is it. Like everything's coming crashing down. <laughs> it's all over. <laughs> and then I'm like now here today and I'm like, how did I, how did I get out of that? Like yes. who did that? Yes. And then I'm, and those are, I mean, we call it testimonies in church, mm -hmm. but it's like, you you just revamp that or you just repackage that into your pitch like yeah. that is literally your pitch yeah and we don't explain that clearly enough when we're talking to people about like you know your 30 second elevator like pitch or like whatever yeah. story you're going to tell like that's literally what it is it's just like go back into the recesses of your mind and think okay when was there a moment where i was just like this is not gonna <laughs> fly <laughs> and, it out. and i don't know where i'm going and if you're okay. able to communicate to the person that you're talking to and then, and they'll see it in your like persona and they'll mm -hmm. see it in the way that the vibe that you're giving off if you can communicate to them like i really thought that that was it and like here i stand today yeah they're like wow exactly. like and people have told me that so that's the only reason why i know that that works because yeah. people have volunteered that information to me otherwise i wouldn't be that um intuitive to realize that but they're like no when you talk i can tell that you really mean what you say and it, it's like coming from the place of the experience right? yeah that's why when you was like i don't have any problem I'm like yes you do i i know the passion in which you shared you know when we when we met because all i kept thinking was you know one of the things we talk about is like we're so underfunded we're so underfunded okay. and under support like, and it's like, yeah and it's it's exhausting right because um you know, even as we're sitting here trying to get resources for other people, we need resources too. Um, and I and I mean, the numbers have been thrown out so many times, but it is less than one percent, right? That's insane. Because it's, it's less not, than point five percent. Yeah, it's so, like point zero two eight or something really foolish, and it makes no sense because there are people with the skills, with the ideas, they have all these things, but no funding, right? Um, and it's easy to reach those points where you feel like you're not going to make it anymore. And I know what that part feels like because, I mean, I have a business that's not funded by anybody but myself. And it's exhausting, you know, um, you know, applying to all these grants and just feeling defeated in the sense of like, what am I going to do if I don't get funding by this date? You know, <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. it's exhausting. And, and I think, like you said, you have to pull some strength out of that. You know, and instead of feeling defeated, be, you know, use that as fuel to know that you have to keep going because there's someone depending on you and people depending on you. And also not just in the work you're doing and the people you serve, but just you being an entrepreneur, you being a nonprofit, you being a digital nomad. You get what I'm trying to say? Like there are people yeah. who need that inspiration to see you make it so they can know that's something feasible for them as well. So it's a lot involved in this process. I think we would be, you know, it would be a mistake for us not to even talk about the mental health aspect of this because mm -hmm. it is such a big piece. When you are doing nonprofit work, um, normally it can be very taxing emotionally. So, like, how are you able to just keep balance? Because it is a lot. I, I work with a nonprofit still back in the States, and um, I don't even work as closely as I used to, and it's still a lot in the sense of, um, you know, you want to do so much to support, but you just only have so much time and so much funding. So how do you manage the, the mental aspect of this journey? Therapy. And <laughs> yeah. um, I, I mean that very seriously. Yeah, yeah. Like, therapy saved my life. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another thing about, like, our community. Um, I think it's getting better now, mm -hmm. especially with the new generation. Like, yes. Gen Z is all about, like, <laughs> I need to, like, I'm taking a my break. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, like, seriously, um, my therapist has... I, I feel a lot of times that the people outside of you like are rooting for you harder than you're rooting for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so like, thank God for the right therapist, like when you can find them to yeah. like be your cheerleader and like really like, sh like from shout you on. Because like, I remember there was one time where I was sitting in my car, literally breaking down and my mm -hmm. therapist was like, well, oh, cause I was asking my therapist, I was like, no, can you please tell me what I'm doing wrong? Like, mm -hmm. there must be something that I am not doing right. Um, that I am realizing. I'm pushing mm -hmm. myself in the wrong direction. She was like, you sound very reasonable, <laughs> Shell. Like, <laughs> there's, there's, you're really being hard on yourself for no reason. Like, you've laid down the facts pretty clearly. Yeah. And I'm telling you, I, I would not tell, and she was like very real. She was a black woman. She was like, I'll, mm -hmm. I would tell you. <laughs> you yeah, if was something crazy. Was like, I don't see anything wrong. Like, you're just, you're taking on a lot of burden. And this is something I wrote about recently. Like you're taking a lot of burden on out of guilt. 
yeah. um, and, and um, this like unrealistic sense of responsibility, which also I would go mm. into like in terms of like if you are considering starting a nonprofit, really, really do some, I, I like the term shadow work, but I, I, I know it's like a buzzword that's going on right now, but really do that. Like what are, what's in the back recesses of your mind that's truly pushing you mm -hmm. to start a nonprofit? Is it guilt? Um, Cause I think I had to re reevaluate that. Like, am I very upset that I am doing much better than other people? And I feel like I need to hurry up and rush and do something. Mm -hmm. You're actually not serving people when you're coming from it, from that kind of deficit mindset. Yeah. You know, I, <laughs> you know like you're, you, you're, you're actually doing on a lot right now, and I know exactly <laughs> what you are talking about. You're doing more harm than good when it's all about you assuaging your own ego rather mm -hmm. than just saying, this is like something that I truly have a strong suit to provide and that I'm also going to, again, allow other people to come in and join as partners. Mm -hmm. Because when you go in with the savior complex, like, oh, I feel guilty, I need to save somebody, and then you run on empty, how is the thing going to continue along without you, right? Yes. Like, that's a lot of things that people don't think, like, who's going to take on this responsibility or this role when you, God forbid, drop dead or mm -hmm. just don't feel like everything. Single man dependency, key man dependency, whatever they call it in engineering <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> yes. And, and I think a lot of people, when you're starting out, you are in that position because you are the one who had the dream, not, you know, this other person. And so you are relying on yourself in the beginning, but there has to be a point of transition where you start to relinquish some of the control so that other people can help. <laughs> if you try to do it all on your own, um, yeah. It it's a, it's a team project. It's, it's never fun. supposed to be like yeah. a single person doing it whatsoever. And how have you been able to find like reputable, credible partners? Because that's the other thing that I think people will find challenges with is like when you're running a business or a nonprofit, the people you partner with can make or break you know what I mean, reputation-wise, like your company. So you have to be very mindful of that. Um, yeah. But how are you, like, how are you, even if it's just like a simple due diligence check, like, how are you vetting the people that you're partnering with? <laughs> I have so many stories. Yes. <laughs> I, okay, so again, t being, like, transparent and making sure you guys see the losses that turned into the wins. Um, when I first started, the first year of my foundation was it was great and the way it ended but it was mm -hmm. a rough and tumble thing okay so um i so i would normally say go through the people who you trust the most which is what i did initially mm -hmm. but even that is not sufficient like you really have to as because um as black women let's just talk about black women specifically as black women because we have so limited access to networks money mm -hmm. um support blah 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 when someone says, like, just says out of their mouth, they didn't even give you a check yet. They just said, they just say, I want to help you. Mm -hmm. We're like, really? Like, really? someone actually saw me? Like, mm -hmm. and then you just get so eager to just run and jump and do whatever that person says mm -hmm. rather than take a beat and say, but why is this person mm -hmm. truly trying to work with me? Right. Yeah. So one of the, I was tell a story and then I'll tell you the lesson that I learned in terms mm -hmm. of due diligence. <laughs> so initially, my very first partner was supposed to be one of the top four um, consulting firms. I won't say what their name is, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they really did me dirty. <laughs> um, <laughs> the first, the, one of the top four consulting firms in the in the world. Um, yeah, but I used to work for one of them, so I hope it wasn't them. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the person <laughs> on the inside who was going to help me with this um, conference that I was building mm -hmm. uh, eventually just had his, oh, had their feelings hurt. <laughs> okay. And um, basically at the last moment, just try to sabotage the event by just saying, like, we taking, we're taking away the, the venue. Mm -hmm. Like, literally one week before mm -hmm. the conference was supposed to happen, after I sold tickets. After I've been doing, I've been on a whole like summer promoting after I booked all the guest speakers. And I literally broke down crying. Like, this is the most embarrassing thing. Like, how can I like recover from this? Like, mm -hmm. I have been advertising this for months yes. and have like really big name like, guest speakers on the ticket. And you and this person just pulled out at the last minute because of something that was not actually tangible, like literally just because of hurt feelings. And um, so what I, I guess the lesson that I learned from that is you should always be asking questions and make sure that 
as you're taking note of what the person is saying that they're going to promise to do a reason why they're doing it, put it down in an MOU that is signed. What's an MOU? Memorandum of agreement. Okay. So memorandums of agreements are not contracts, Mm -hmm. but it's a starting point to hold the person accountable and say like, Hey, as we're having these conversations, I've just been taking down some notes. Yes. And now that I feel like, and I would also say have multiple conversations so that you can see consistency. Yeah. Because if I had had more and more meetings with this person after mm-hmm. a while, I would have started to see like little like weird things and like um, noticed more about his tone mm-hmm. that would have been a red flag for me. It yeah. should have been a red flag for me. Yes. So when you when you do those meetings over and over again, and then you see consistency in the level of energy that they're bringing, and also mm-hmm. like at least have one little, they should at least provide like one little evidence of something that costs them nothing that mm-hmm. they're doing to help you. Like whether it's like, oh, let me introduce you to this person to have a meeting, mm-hmm. um, or let me like um, bring you actually to the venue and actually see it for yourself, and let's start like talking about what can actually happen here. Then it's like okay. That's the green flag to go. So I should have put everything in the MOU. <laughs> no, it's, listen, these are valuable lessons learned. Share with other people so they don't make the same yeah. mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. And then go slow. Like, go yeah. very, very slow. Like, I was rushing to start this conference because I wanted to have proof of concept so I can start applying for grants. Mm-hmm. Um, start, like, you know, being able to say, look what I did. Like, if you just gave me more money, then mm-hmm. imagine how much bigger it could be. Yes. Not knowing <laughs> later on, I was just going to get a C grant for basically doing nothing and people yeah. just having trust in me um so also have faith in yourself yes, 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 yes. <laughs> i know that when once one person says no don't take it personally it's yeah. probably just not the right fit exactly. and it's, you're probably you probably should be happy that the person said no because it could have gone like a terrible down a terrible route yes and and like you said i mean do the work right you know you have to do the due diligence part you need to ask the right questions document everything <laughs> Um, and, yeah. and, the, and in the nonprofit world, because a lot of people, they don't know if it's like appropriate because they think, oh, it's not a business. Like it is a business. It's just that the profits go back into the community that you're serving. It's so, a fancy term for a business. Yeah. <laughs> so you still need contracts and you still need agreements. Um, you can't always, you know, just like hope that someone's, you know, word of mouth, you know, is going to be like, oh, or someone's word is going to be credible enough um, to sustain whatever you're trying to do or relationship. So I think it is important, like have things in writing and with, I think it's important for us to talk about like the whole digital nomad aspect of this, because, you know, being in person with people versus when you have to transition and start running your nonprofit virtually because of COVID and other things, like what was that transition? Like how did that influence your relationship building? Yeah. So I'm so grateful for the risk that I took, um, because if I didn't take that risk of applying for a grant Mm -hmm. um, to do that uh, project, that um, pilot project in Nairobi, move myself to Nairobi Mm -hmm. (laughs) and and live for, you know, however long I was able to live there, great, thankfully, until um, COVID hit. I literally left Nairobi in March, like a week before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the fact that I've managed to be able to do all of that in three weeks time, uh, I mean, sorry, three months time, yes. um, really was like the found, but was the foundation I needed. Mm-hmm. It was not easy yes. and it's never easy, especially when we were just first making that transition into what, how do we do things virtually? Because mm-hmm. the way that things are set up or pre COVID, cause every, the world is different now. Pre COVID, the way the world was set up in Africa, um, there was no such thing really as remote. Mm -hmm. anything like everything happened in person because Mm -hmm. of just like culture people believe like you have to be in front of you know other Mm -hmm. people to really show that you're working Mm -hmm. but then also because like the infrastructure is just frankly not strong enough for people to work remotely Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so it's a very very fairly new concept in africa so it was the it was the fact that i was on the ground right before everything shut down and saw people face to face Mm -hmm. that laid the foundation for me to be able to say okay unfortunately it's not by choice i am here but i still need want things to get done like how can we make this work and because they saw like my attitude and my like you know again this genuine authentic um passion and vibe that comes across when i was doing the work on the ground they were like of course like we would move mountains if we need support yes when it's virtual 
No, yeah. and that that's key too to having people on the ground who can still support. You know what I mean? <laughs> because without Absolutely. them, I mean, would you be able to do the work that you're doing? Uh, probably not. Yeah. So, yeah, those yeah. initial relationships are really important, and I think it's important to call out that like you didn't just start out completely doing it digitally. You know, like virtually it started out in person. So, just something for Absolutely. people to keep in mind: there is some work that needs to be done on the ground, um, even if you are running no, I mean, like, like, virtually. Look. So there were some relationships that I did build yeah. um, totally virtually. So it was a combination of I had the people who had my trust already mm -hmm. who were on the ground, right? And I used that as leverage to now reach out to people who I've never met to this Before. day. Okay. So one of my biggest partners to date for the Carfee Foundation mm -hmm. is the University of Chicago. Oh, nice. Top 10 universities mm -hmm. in the United States probably one of the top in the world. Mm -hmm. um, never met this woman in person. I was just on a Facebook group for Black Women in Development. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually the name of the group, Black Women in Development. Mm -hmm. And she had just written a post about something totally unrelated. Okay. But I connected with her to ask, answer her question. And then I was like, but hey, by the way, like, what do you think about this program that I'm doing, like just yes. in conversation? And she ended up making that the university literally my long-term partner today. I've worked with them twice now on I two remote projects. Yes. Um, one was a virtual workshop for African people in Africa who wanted to um, start a healthcare um, startup after you know what happened with COVID. Yes. And then this last summer, um, this year, having holding a three-month incubator program for um, Niger women in rural Nigeria who were looking to build their um, businesses I love from the ground. This. Yes, yes, yes. And they, and they, they voluntarily reach out to me <laughs> yes. to this day. Yes. To say, okay, what are we doing next year? What are we doing yes. next summer? Like I love that. The relationship building is so critical. And, the, and the, the aspect of relationship building that I think helps the most is what people don't realize is sometimes in order to get really big funding or grants, you have to show like what you've done so far. And so these partnerships and relationships literally sometimes are the stepping stones to get you funded. Um, they Even if they don't give you funding, you know what I mean? You need it mm -hmm. as like a credibility measure, you know, to say like, yes, what I'm doing is credible and this is my proof of concept. These are the relationships that I have and now you can give me some money. <laughs> and and you, they, gave me, they gave me staff, they gave me a team, right? So yeah. I didn't, at no cost of my own, University of Chicago gave me the entire team to run the incubator program yes. this summer and also the, the previous summer to run that workshop. That is so awesome. So normally I would have had to pay that salary staff, but yes. they were like, no, we don't need you. I love that. Thank you for even sharing that because that's something that I don't think a lot of people even think about as an option, right? For a way to get support. It may not be directly financial, but that helps financially, right? But, um, you um, I love that. Thank you, University of Chicago. Yes. <laughs> no, listen. No, no, that's, that's very, 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 that's really good insight. Um, so we have about like 20 minutes left, and I wanted to make sure that I left some time for you to talk about just this whole past, <laughs> what has it been, a year and a half now? Wait, what year? Has it been two years since like COVID year started? I don't know. <laughs> I don't, it's all gone by so fast. <laughs> What has been the biggest, like, shift that you've had to make, though? Like, you know, I know the relationship building. Okay, maybe I can't do it in person. I got to leverage other, you know, relationships I already have to build new ones now. But what has been the biggest shift for you um, just adjusting to being abroad as a non- I mean, being abroad as a digital nomad and running nonprofit? The biggest shift? Huh. I want to say it's literally just being okay with, oh, this is probably like a lie kind of, I'm still working on it, mm -hmm. <laughs> but being okay with not really knowing how things are going to turn out. Like literally yes. everything is kind of starting <laughs> or kind of being that, that is such, at the very last minute. Oh my God, that is such, <laughs> that is such a beautiful lesson that you just shared i think mm -hmm. you have to be okay with not knowing how this is going to end. when i say end or go you just have to be okay with it you have to relinquish the control of thinking you can dictate every step or the outcomes because it will drive you crazy because life happens <laughs> and these things do not go the way you look at me you see how you touched the point right? you, you definitely touched the point for me um, yes, that's amazing advice. I, I, I wish. Someone said, 
being okay with not being okay. I was like, yes, girl. Yes, that's really what it is. <laughs> I am not okay. <laughs> I, am, I am not okay. You know that, that meme they have with the things on fire and the person's just swinging? <laughs> it's just like, that's you mean, really, really have to be okay with knowing that there are ebbs and flows. And when things are not flowing and they ebb or <laughs> whatever you want to call it, the ups, the downs, you really need to be okay with knowing how to still operate during those down periods because they will happen. Um, I think even outside of the nonprofit space, outside of being a digital nomad, just in life, um, you really do need to be okay with those uh, ebbs and flows because they happen a lot, <laughs> a lot more often than you would mm -hmm. think. And even regardless of the outwards appearance of people's organizations or businesses, you never really know what's going on behind the scenes. So don't get discouraged if it looks like everyone else is not going through it or it's so easy for everyone else because all of us are going through it like all of us are trying to figure this out yeah. you know absolutely yeah absolutely. yeah that's really great advice <laughs> um and i can't again i can't see the comments like yesterday so i won't go on a whole oh rant but um if you guys have any questions please feel free to drop them in the comments box because i can see um the question not comments in the questions box so one of the other things i want to talk about you are what do you call it is it a it's a jack of, of many trades. Is that the right phrase? I always the master, master. Of, the master of all. Either way, <laughs> you are very talent, multi talented, and you do a lot of different things. Um, and the more I got to know you, I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to reach out. I need help. <laughs> so, can you kind of talk about, in addition to the nonprofit work, one of the ways that you're able to support yourself abroad is through other services that you offer? Because um, you do mm -hmm. some consulting as I as I'm, and you have products and things like that. So kind of talk about yeah. that, too, because what people don't realize is that you can run a nonprofit and then you can monetize your consulting skills for the nonprofit. <laughs> you get what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. Something that people don't think about. So I think that's another tip that we should kind of share and kind of delve and get some insight into. Yeah. So, guys, like nonprofit just means that you can't pocket the profits. Mm -hmm. You need to be making the profit. You need to make profit. Yeah. <laughs> You're invested back into the community. Yeah. Yeah, the business, the entity should make a profit. You cannot take the extra income and put it into your pocket, but you should yeah. definitely budget in a decent salary for you to survive. So I just wanted to make sure that that's clear. Yeah. Um, so now, now going to that point, then how are you going to profit so that the entity can keep living, right? Um, that's exactly why I made my organization a hybrid organization. Like you hear sometimes people say, oh, I'm going to start a B Corp, which is like, Okay, you, it's still a, a, a whole process, and it, it does um, make you look really good when you have that certification, but it's not nonprofit. It's like, I'm a business, but I'm certified as really doing social good. Okay. Um, but the reason why I decided to do a hybrid organization is because I also think that it's important to separate the two, like mm -hmm. to make it very distinct, like, okay, this is the side where we're doing this, and then mm -hmm. this is the side where we're doing that for accounting reasons, mm -hmm. and then just also, again, like, just to make it very clear that you, like, things are separate um, yeah. and not make it too convoluted. Because people sometimes feel weird, like, oh, are you profiting off of like the backs so again, like we said, like of people yeah. who are struggling. Mm -hmm. So um, the ways that I make profit for both things, um, number one, uh, people do hire me. The main thing that people hire me for, this is literally the thing I get paid the most for is grant writing. Okay. So if people come to me, because I, I've had, I have a um, track record of raising over $5 million. That's amazing. For, um, yeah for nonprofit organizations. So uh, people are like, yeah, we need money. So write, <laughs> <laughs> write the grant applications for yeah. us, write the proposals. Yeah. And it is not easy, y'all. Like, mm -hmm. it'd it be stressing me out. Like, it is it, it is a, like, talent, but I, I, I'm so grateful that I've been, I've had that track record yes. of success and um, getting people the money they need to, you know, build up the entities that they, that they started. So grant writing, number one. Mm -hmm. And then number two, um, one thing that I took a step back to say, and I think this is really, really important, I actually would rather people hire me for this more than grant writing, mm -hmm. is to do a audit mm -hmm. of your nonprofit. Yes. And by audit, I mean, like, before you even say, let's go write the grant proposal, did I set myself up for success? Yes. Right? Like, did I, I know people know the basics, like, oh, you have to file your 501c3, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. But it's a lot more than that. Like, that's mm -hmm. the easy part. With, and that part's not even really easy. Yeah, yeah, I, was <laughs> but that's like, I don't think that part is easy, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you take that for granted. But it's like, there's so many other things that um, grant-making institutions, the people that give you the money are looking for, that if they see that you didn't even think about it or put it into consideration or have some kind of structure set up to address it in the future, mm -hmm. they're not going to give you money. Okay. They're not. 
-hmm. So it's like, I can write all the grant proposals in the world for you, but if you did not set yourself up for success, um, like internally, yes. no one's ever going to get approve any of those proposals. So I would actually prefer you if you are considering to start a nonprofit or you have one already to hire me first for the audit, the yes. nonprofit audit. Yes. 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 <laughs> because yes. I don't want you to come to me and for ask for your proposal. Why didn't I get no money? <laughs> yeah, it's like the foundation. Because, right. Yeah, because even, even the most successful nonprofit, like <laughs> you have a 100% chance of having at least one of your proposals getting denied. Mm -hmm. So it's like writing a grant proposal is not a guarantee that you're going to get money regardless. Yeah. But now you don't, you also just don't want it to make it so easy for grant making institutions to say no to you. Okay. So the grant writing, so the actual writing of the proposals for yes. those of you who are looking to fundraise, um, the fund, the nonprofit audit. So just yes. to make sure you have all your internal structures in place. Yes. Um, I then also do, uh, so I, like I said, I have a background in communication. So yes. a lot of my consultations also like building your um, brand image mm -hmm. online, mm -hmm. which I think for, I get a comment for that a lot too. When people, when I reach out to people for partnerships, they're like, oh, you really intentionally worked on your SEO, because if you search my name, it's yes. like, boom, TED yes. Talk, yes. boom, my website, yes, yes, <laughs> boom, yes. my blog, like, yeah, so I, I advise people on how to build that up, too, to make sure, like, when people search you, they're like, oh, no, this person is legit, like, exactly. they have everything, you know, like, your high school essay or something like that coming up <laughs> first. <in the> <laughs> no, I know what you mean, yeah, because that even... Even just even having that understanding of the importance of the um, the SEO is search engine optimization, meaning that when someone types in your name or types in your organization or something keywords for your organization that you pop up. For anyone who's not familiar, because I know sometimes people don't even know what SEO means. Yeah. Oh yeah, search engine yeah. optimization. Yeah. Thank you for defining that. Yeah. And then just like for my personal self, because you know you gotta have multiple streams of income and just mm -hmm. protect yourself at all costs. Like yeah. <laughs> I I really delved heavily into um, investing. Yes. as a side hustle so um i i also do videos on youtube just talking about like my different strategies i've been using to use that as additional income yeah uh really took advantage of the unfortunate like crash that happened in march yes. <laughs> of 2020 with the stock market but i learned a lesson from when i was younger that oh that's the time to buy yeah <laughs> and nice. I've been, like building up my portfolio since then and working on different strategies to ensure that that's also like some guaranteed income um in addition to everything else that I do. <laughs> no, I love that. And it, and it's good to be, like you said, you cannot put all your eggs in one basket. Because, I mean, as we saw with COVID, people who are already in the travel industry, or maybe like travel influencers overnight could have had a lot of their partnerships or funding mm -hmm. resources or, you know, funnels just kind of, you know, <laughs> shut short, cut short. So, yeah, you really do need to be flexible. Mm -hmm. um, and it's good to know how to also pivot into spaces where you can do things dig digitally as well. Hold on, I'm just checking some of the questions because I do see that we have. Okay, let me pull this one up. Can you all see the question? I can, yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay, okay. Are you currently planning on um, Giving Tuesday campaigns for non for any of the nonprofits? If anyone doesn't so, know, Giving Tuesday is like a, it's a national day where um, nonprofits kind of are able to like promote and people are supposed to support. So yeah, that's Giving Tuesday. Yeah, I agree that. Yeah, I love. So um, I'm I'm on sabbatical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was on sabbatical for a little bit. Like mm -hmm. I'm 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 back to work now. But um, I was taking a break because I of that intensive uh, incubator program I did this summer. Yeah. But if you are someone who is looking to build a campaign for um, something like Giving Tuesday, I would say that you need to plan that far in advance um so it's probably a little too late you're going to be rushing a bit like mm -hmm. to build something like that can be really successful and impactful right now yes. because it's right around the corner um in my past campaigns that i've done in, um with nonprofits, we started planning in august okay okay we're giving tuesday we're giving because tuesday. the thing about like getting people like to give you money um especially when it's just like with, when they're not getting anything really in return, it's of good vibes, mm -hmm. is that yeah. um, you have to like gradually like butter them up. Okay. <laughs> and so waiting, yeah. <laughs> waiting yeah. to, to <laughs> last minute to like tell them, hey, by the way, it's giving Tuesday, give me money, like yeah. it's, it's kind of pushing. Yeah. Um, so if you, if that's something that people um, want consultation and I can definitely help you with that because I have run um, giving Tuesday campaigns in the past. And this question is, um, are there resources for those of us desiring to start a hybrid organization? So it's something you can literally just do um, in terms like the resources, the same things that you would steps that you would take to file your LLC, right? 
or to file your articles of incorporation for a nonprofit, you literally just do both mm -hmm. and then just make sure that they they both have the same like name so that mm -hmm. they can clearly be, look like they relate, right? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. there's no like formal application or um, like anything formal you have to do with like the government to say these two entities coexist mm -hmm. because whatever separate paperwork you're filing is always going to show who the leadership is. So it's going to yeah. be evident that it's you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then also like in terms of working on your branding and like putting things online, you just want to make sure you communicate. By the way, these are two, these two things are related. Yes. So like when I introduce my organization, I usually just say Carfi, but like the first time I'm introducing you to people, I say oh, this Carfi LLC and then this Carfi Foundation, but they yes. all fall under Carfi. Yes, I love that. And I know, um, okay, let me just check one more. Okay, I think I'm going to say, I want to make sure I didn't, because the number that comes up doesn't match the number of things, so I was a little confused. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So um, I wanted to, we only have a few minutes left, but I wanted to make sure we left space for, if there's anything you wanted to share, talk about a tip that you had in mind that we didn't get a chance to discuss, because um, I know I go off on tangents all the time. Um, I just want to make sure that you had an opportunity to share that with the audience or just any overall insight <laughs> because as you mentioned, like you like, you know, if you could have spoken to, if you could speak to your pre digital nomad, pre fundraising, pre business only entrepreneur self, like what advice <laughs> would you now give yourself with the knowledge that you have now? Excuse me. <laughs> um, yeah, the joy, the air is getting dry. Yeah. Um, I'll put it this way. Um, I, I, I would tell myself not to, uh, that there's, there's something inside of you that is pointing you in the direction mm -hmm. that you just have to, you, you have to just pay close attention to. Like one, of the, one clear tip I would give maybe is to journal. Because mm -hmm. I noticed that when I, and I haven't been doing that enough since I've been here. Yeah. Which I regret, which is why I have to usually like rely on memory, but thank God, like they're so vivid. Um, if I were journaling like every single day since I got here, I would have seen the thread mm -hmm. of like why I'm supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. Like, not to, um, this is not even mushy at all, but like, there's no world where I would have met you, Shamar. Yeah. If I had just said, well, let me be comfortable and just stay in New York. Exactly. No, I, so I wholeheartedly believe, um, like when I meet people, I'm like, none of this is a coincidence. Um, it all makes sense to me because especially it's just such a weird organic way. Even the way we met that gentleman um, when we were at brunch, right? I mean, he's from Detroit. Like, what are the chances? You get what I'm trying to say? Like, just it's so random, but not random, if you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. um, by it's taking good. that leap, getting out of your comfort zone, you'll be so shocked at the relationships you can build, the people you can meet. Um, you really just have to get comfortable with just knowing that, like, you won't have all the answers. But if you take the risk and just do things like you can't just sit in your, you know, your house and not do anything. You have to put yourself out there. You got to do the work. You got to get on these lives, things like that. Like, you know how terrified I was my first live. If you guys go back and watch the very first expat chats, you'll probably laugh half of the way through. <laughs> I was so nervous and so scared. Um, I hate being on camera, but my passion for sharing these stories is stronger than, you know what I mean? Like the fear that I have of being on camera. So you just get over it. And now it's easy peasy. So, uh, so I say like you just and that's a word right there. Like yeah. my passion, mm -hmm. your passion, your passion. You know you're in the right place when your passion overrides your fear. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I like that. I, I was passionate about leaving New York. I, <laughs> yes. like, I need to get out of here. But then I was like, when I got here, I was like, shown. Like, did yeah. you really think this through? Like, mm -hmm. why did you like just do that? And yes. and like, oh, now you're gonna really like suffer the consequences of it blah 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 like and it's really just self-doubt it's just me like yes. the like negative voice internal voice inside my head trying to like quell the passion that drove mm -hmm. me here and yeah then, literally like when i think back at all the people i've met here i was like there was a reason why it's an absolute <laughs> reason i'm so glad we had a chance to meet and it's crazy because initially like you know we were it was like a dinner and then that got canceled and then we ended up at there you know and it's just like but but then that ended up being a better you know, place to chat and all that stuff and the, where I was going to sit before. Everything just kind of is weird. It's, it's too much to be sharing on here. But the whole, my whole point is, like, you're right. Like, these things do happen for a reason. And you really have to trust your gut on some of this stuff when it comes to, um, you know, kind of just stepping out of your, your comfort zone. And not everything is going to be a win in the sense that every time you meet someone, it's going to be a phenomenal, you know, friendship or relationship or something that's beneficial or whatever, exchange of good energy. But 
you'll probably have more positive than negative most of the time. And if not, you probably need to do some work on yourself. So <laughs> I tell people, if you keep meeting bad, crappy people, you probably should do some internal evaluation at some point. <laughs> I know that seems mean, but I'm just being honest. Um, no, it's true. Yeah. Like, I've been getting therapy saved my life. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Therapy has definitely saved me on so many occasions. Um, I really, really... Woo. Like I said, do the work, man. The internal work, too. Get a therapist. Yeah. Get a good one. If you have a crappy therapist, get rid of them. Go find another one, but definitely get a yeah. therapist. Yeah, yeah. Stay, stay with it, because it can be hard. Like, it took me a while to get, like, someone really, really good, so. I hit the jackpot, man, because I went years with, well, yeah, I had a really, really bad one, and then I ended up, like, not going for years, and then decided to start going again and I just got so lucky I found the best therapist for myself a black woman as well phenomenal just mm -hmm. like just really understands me if you know what I mean and so I'm like I'm very grateful for her um because she's helped me through a lot all right well um uh, <laughs> oh so many things to talk about um I can talk for another hour I always say that because it's always so much to share um I love sharing these stories and when you were sharing with me what you were doing, I was really excited to share with other people because I'm like, there's so many of us doing super dope work and just more people need to know and be aware about it. Um, I hope that the link in your bio is the best way if people are interested in any of the services that you provide or finding out more about the nonprofit. Absolutely. So I have all the major links there. So you just have to scroll down to find the one that's best for what you're looking for. So if you yeah. want to subscribe to my, I have a Substack a uh, newsletter that I send out with all my videos and any like new like services that I'm providing. So yes. the easiest way to stay um, on top of like what you can, what offers I have is to sign up for the Substack um, email newsletter. Okay. And that's the very first link when you click on the link in my bio. If you scroll um, all the way down, that's where you can book me directly. So okay. if there's any of you out there who are who want to do the fundraising audit mm -hmm. because you do have a nonprofit or you're looking to start one, you just scroll down um, that link in my bio and you'll see where you can book me um, for a consultation yes, uh, yes. to do that. Yes. And support black owned businesses. You guys, <laughs> we are underfunded and we need support. So <laughs> from one small black owned business to another, I understand. <laughs> we could talk about that for a whole another hour. Um, but <laughs> just thank you for being on. Thank you for being so transparent. I appreciate the tips that yeah. you offered, um, especially the one about, you know, if you're doing a partnership, they may not give you funding, but they may give you the resources that can really help you execute an idea. Yeah. I love that. Um, and just encouraging people to look into things like the African Business Conference. That's what it's called. The one from Harvard. Yes. So if you guys are interested in that space um, and also they want to reach out to you, is it best to reach out through IG or through your um, the link in your bio? Go to the link in my bio. bio. OK, okay. link in the bio. If you guys want to connect, mm -hmm. um, go follow, go support. And I'm sure we'll see more of you. Um, look forward to doing, you know, I always do like a little one year anniversary. So I kind of get everybody back on. So it would be nice to get Aww. an update. And <laughs> um, probably about when's the one year anniversary next summer. Um, so I'm sure we will see you again on expat chats. Um, and thank you for everyone who joined. Um, if you're watching this replay, I'll have all the links of um, what we discussed. Um, and then the link from your bio, I'll put that in the um, caption as well. So people can, can grab, um, can go to the link from there. All righty. Well, yeah. thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, pleasure, Sean, and everyone else. I will be taking another break. So you guys may not see me for a while, but enjoy and happy holidays to everybody. All right. Bye. Happy holidays.